For you guys who don't know, um, Josh is one of the founders of Evolving Hockey. That's where you see all those charts coming at you. So Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the work that you do with Evolving Hockey and what you can find on Evolving Hockey? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it's so yeah, I'm my uh, I'm half of the uh, kind of the creating creative team, or I guess the creators behind the website Evolving Hockey.com for anyone who wants to go check it out. Um, we and I work with my uh, twin brother. We also are on Twitter at Evolving Wild. If you've seen any of our, uh, I guess, hot takes or dust ups here that you know pop up here or there, but um, we've been working on uh, the website, but also just generally working in hockey analytics, hockey statistics, or data, or whatever you want to call it, for um, probably getting close to four years now, I believe, maybe a little longer. Um, it's kind of an interesting uh, entry for us, I believe, uh, compared to some other people, because um, we were mostly just, you know, we're, we're from Minnesota, we live in Minnesota, but uh, we are fairly late to the game in terms of just, you know, becoming fans. It, I didn't really start watching or following or understanding hockey, really, until I was probably out of college is about when I, um, when both my brother and I, we grew up as baseball fans uh, and baseball players. And so that was kind of the sport that we both um, were fans of and, and really kind of what was influenced uh, or very influential in terms of us getting into hockey stuff, but as part of being baseball fans and just kind of being general, uh, um, really interested in that stuff, we started uh, kind of, you know, going down the, the road of the sabermetrics kind of movement in, in baseball for a while. And we're quite familiar with the, um, the various websites like Fangraphs and uh, Baseball Reference, Baseball Prospectus, um, watched a lot of the games and, and kind of took that mentality when we first started watching hockey. And it really just grew as more of just a hobby than anything else. It was just something to work on. We both found it really enjoyable and it was the, the data is pretty rich. And um, the, I think the analytics community has been, you know, it's been very vibrant for five, six, seven years now, even longer. Um, if you kind of go back to the origins of the NHL's data that's been available. Um, and so, yeah, that it really was just, we kind of uh, both became pretty obsessed with just working on it all the time. And, and it wasn't really ever a plan to start a website or to, um, ever really do anything that was like what it turned into, but ultimately we kind of kept working at it. We met some people, we, we got asked um, very fortunately if we wanted to write for Hockey Graphs, the blog, um, and that really kind of jump-started us just getting into the community and, and, and working with the data. And, and as we went along, we learned a little bit more and we kind of got a hold of and learned and became very uh, into the programming language, or I guess it's, it's more of a statistical language called R. And after that, we just kept working. We made some models, we made some metrics. Uh, Google Sheets wasn't really working for us to provide those as efficiently as we wanted to people. And so we then went down the road of making Evolving Hockey. And since then, it's just been kind of a passion project. We've just been working on it for a long time and we keep working on it. It's almost, it's, it's very much a daily thing for us now. So that's kind of a bit of a rambly background on, on, on my and my brother's, um, our kind of background and how we got into it. I know I, alongside many others, are very grateful that you guys eventually went down the path of making a website since the data available is amazing. Actually, I currently live abroad right now. So when I'm talking about North American sports, I'm talking from the perspective of someone who's not in North America anymore. And having yeah, access yeah. having access to dads like that is, at least for me, is something that's important considering the fact that I can't watch as much as I used to. So being able to see something that's as accurate as it is and it's reflecting as much as the game as your work is, is actually really amazing for me. So I guess I'm grateful for that. And then, yeah, I mean, th thanks so much for the, the kind words. It, it, we get, it's really, that's one of the things that really drives us to keep going. And, and, and well, not that we would quit at any time, but it really is a fuel to, for us when we have a lot of people and just fans um, and people interested in the game who like to use our site and, and find value in it and, and kind of helps them enrich their understanding of the game, but also just while they're watching it and just stuff to do. That's kind of one of the main reasons why, uh, you know, what's really pushed us to kind of keep going and, and adding stuff and supporting it and all that. So it's sure great to hear. You sort of hinted at this in, in, a, in your previous answer, and I know that what's called the math behind your work is very complex for most people. But how, if you had to explain like the mathematical process, like simply to someone behind the data that you can find on Evolving Hockey, how would you explain it? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think there's a couple different routes you can go in terms of uh, expl explaining. So I'll try to cover a few, because I think that it's maybe the work that we do is probably more, um, than just like one area, but 
Um, I would say it's probably a combination of two things, which is really kind of data engineering and then data science or data modeling or, or whatever you want to call um, in that uh, respect. And so on the first side is kind of more the data engineering and um, data architecture is sometimes what it's called. There's a lot of buzzwords for these, these terms, but um, I, we don't necessarily, we just kind of do what we have to. But uh, what goes into the site is, is really, um, there's a lot of, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of data, a lot of um, numbers and just making sure that all lines up there. You kind of have your standard issues with player names and um, making sure that users uh, have consistent, um, very robust data, I think is the one part. And that's a little bit more on, um, we, we, Luke and I tend to do a lot of the things kind of together, but we tend to um, have like kind of more of our own focuses, even though that um, we do kind of okay and, and bounce ideas off of each other. So then the first one is, Kind of the whole deck, or the um, you can all, you can call it analysis, although it's more just um, tools that lead to better analysis potentially. But uh, that is um, more like our uh, our war model, our RAPM or RAPM model, as some people who maybe are familiar with the site um, maybe know. And then the other one that a lot of people know the website for is our contract projection model. Uh, we do some other stuff here and there. We have like our, our XG or expected goals model is another one. So those all kind of, they kind of go hand in hand because you need the architecture and the data engineering and that robustness in terms of your database usage to then be able to supply and, and, and work with um, the modeling aspect and, and provide metrics that are really useful to people on top of the kind of more standard NHL stuff like box score stats, like points and blocks and hits and that stuff. So that's kind of a general idea. Um, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question, but that's kind of the background of it. No, the answer is actually amazing. And there's certainly a lot of depth that goes into these processes, which I feel like not everyone understands just like how much depth is into it. And then now I don't think there's a better way to possibly explain it than looking at the RAPM charts, RAPM charts themselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen. I'm going to present um, Jared Spurgeon's um, RAPM chart, RAPM chart. And do you think you can explain what like each of the bars mean on that chart and what information you can conclude from it? Yeah, it sounds great. So here it is. Do you see it? Yeah, perfect. All right, so let's uh, so here let's look at the even strength for now before we get to the power power play. So, what can someone conclude when they see this chart right now? Yeah, so a little bit of background, um, just for anyone who isn't familiar with this, or this looks just like some colors and some bars, and it's hard to understand. Is that each one of these bars is um, a representation of a model that uh, that we um, have developed and it's not actually it well sorry i don't i don't want to say developed it was a model that's been around for a while um which at least in terms of the framework of it and it's it's called uh rapm or regular regular regularized adjusted plus minus which was really um started and uh kind of pioneered in, in basketball actually in the nba um you know, maybe eight longer than it's been around for a while and there have been a few other of these um in, in hockey uh um Dominic Gal Gal uh, what's his Gallimini, so Sorry, uh, he, he had one several years ago in his old hero charts. And then um, Dawson Spriggins, who is current uh, analyst or, and, and data scientist for the um, Colorado Avalanche, he also had a similar type model. And, and, but really, Brian McDonald, who used to work for the Panthers, he's now the main, I, I, don't, I can't remember his title, but he's the, kind of the director of um, NHL data and, and statistics for ESPN now. Uh, he was the one who really kind of brought it over from basketball, pioneered it, showed how you could do similar or the same kind of techniques in hockey. Uh, and so that's what each one of these bars is, is essentially that kind of model. And ultimately what it, what it does, it's, it's an attempt to um, evaluate and, and uh, the, the val or I guess to, to, to put a value on um, the kind of uh, uh, an area of, of the game that you want to look at. So in this case, each one of these bars, you have goals for, so GF, XGF, uh, CF, and XGA. Um, goals for, or, G is, or GF stands for goals for, XGF stands for expected goals for, and then CF stands for Corsi for, and then XGA and, and CA are the defensive side of the game. So the three bars on the left of that chart are offense. The two on the right are, are defense. Um, and goals for is, and, and Corsi for are more, more straightforward. Um, goals for is an evaluation of how that players impact on their team's uh, goals uh, relative to every, all, a bunch of other things that we keep, that we keep um, 
uh, we kind of take into account in the model. And then expected goals for is the metric expected goals. Um, I don't want to get too much into that. We can maybe talk about that a little later, but it's a similar evaluation of, uh, I guess, a probability that a shot will become a goal. And then course four is, is shot attempts. So it's just all, um, all shots, goals, uh, block shots, and misses are um, considered in that. And so each one of these basically evaluates how a player does, um, in a, and this is now converted into a Z-score, which is, um, it's, it's a comparison to the, to the positional mean. So you take all defensemen in the league, and then it's one, two, or three standard deviations away from in either direction. So the blue or purple, depends on how you see the color, is, is better. That means there are, on average, um, providing more value to each one of those metrics um, than the rest of the league. And if they're negative, then they would be kind of below average. Uh, and so that's kind of the general approach. We don't include, I will just put this caveat on, we don't include goals against uh, as a, a, in this, although the model does produce that value because we think it's fairly um, problematic. It's misleading. Also, it's very difficult with the, um, I, I think that there's, I don't want to get too much into it, but goals against as a, a metric for skater defense evaluation is, is very troublesome. And, and we'd like to avoid uh, providing that information because it just doesn't particularly um, mean anything. It's not something a player has a lot of control over because goalies exist in hockey. So that's a kind of a general overview. I mean, I think that kind of covered it, but if you have any other uh, specific questions, I'd be happy to answer it. This one's a little bit more specific here. So we have Spurgeon. So like, as you see, we see the bar. So when you see, when you, like you've made the, you've part made the graph, like if someone is looking at it, what can they conclude about Spurgeon and his impact on the Minnesota Wild? Well, he's very good. <laughs> uh, it's very, it's very rare to see a player who um, excels in every area of the game, especially in each of the offensive ones um, or offensive categories, along with also having, I mean, great defensive um, stats you have. There's a, I think it's pretty easy for um, maybe people who aren't as familiar with this or don't necessarily have a lot of analytical background, quote unquote, who don't know some of these stats, but it's pretty easy to kind of tell to, to describe a player type, which we see fairly often, someone like Ovechkin or Patrick Kane or Phil Kessel. Um, there's a, there's a few out there, but it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a consistent player type among high kind of point uh, or goal scoring uh, forwards specifically, but also it happens with defensemen who produce a lot on offense, um, but are really uh, also give up a lot on defense. And so what that chart would look like is another good example, believe it or not, is someone like Connor McDavid is another player who's historically uh um, been uh, kind of uh, below average or pretty bad actually defensively from some of our metrics. And so you kind of, it's a balance. That's the thing I think it's important to remember as well why we have both of these is that hockey, especially for skater evaluation, um, it's really important to, to take in mind both how a player does offensively and also what they're doing defensively because it's just they're equal parts to a player um, in terms of their game. And so um, it's, it's, it's pretty rare to see a player like Jared Spurgeon like this, who has kind of all positive stats. Most of the time you have some um, deviation on defense or maybe a player has a really good shot and, and is, you know, has a really good shooting ability. And so their, their goals for um, that, that first bar on the left there, that one might be higher, but say they, they don't, maybe their shots aren't as valuable. And so, you, so they maybe have a little more skill with their shooting ability. You might not see that XGF bar uh, that might be lower, which is also something that you see, like maybe like Matt Dumba is another, is a good example of that. Or um, Kuznetsov is another one who kind of has that type of uh, 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 player type. And so another other players who kind of look like this, or this is kind of like almost getting close to what I would consider an award um, uh, award, uh, like in the Norris conversation, for instance, for, for Spurgeon. Um, other players like Sean Couturier looks like this often. Mark Stone, um, uh, Sidney Crosby, Ken here and there in early in his career. Pavel Datsuk is another absolute stellar player who looks like this as well. So that's kind of what Spurgeon looks like. So as you talked about, they're usually players, like I said, they have a weakness. So I'm going to switch over. Are you able to see um, the comparison right now between Spurgeon and Riley? Yeah, yep. All right, so now when so someone goes on, they use they decide to use the compare skaters at even strength tool that you guys have, and so we're comparing Spurgeon and Riley. What so like now you're coming with the takeaways? Who would you like? Would you take away as the better player from this comparison, and who and what information can you include about the different play styles between Spurgeon and Riley? 
Yeah, so this is kind of like what I said earlier. Is, is It's a lot more common to see players like this, not specifically like that, like Riley, because he's also fairly unique, but also another kind of play style. Um, but generally, it what you would see here is, is, is – Riley is very, very good offensively. Um, he produce, he has a lot of value on offense from all three of those uh, metrics, but defensively, he also, he gives up more when he's out on, when he's on the ice um, relative to, to his position in the, in the league. Uh, it's, I also want to make a, a note that it's generally, and it's, it's kind of hard to, um, to show this. And we've thought about different ways to maybe uh, accentuate this or, 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 or highlight this, but it is important to, um, I also think to kind of compare one offensive stat to another, to, to, to one defensive stat, or maybe two offensive stats to two uh, defensive stats, because kind of looking at it this way can be a little um, misleading, I think, because for instance, XG um, and Corsi are often somewhat uh, highly correlated between the two of them, because, there are uh, the amount of shots that you have or that you take generally um, also increases your XG. Um, it's not fully that way because we have, as I maybe, I don't think I mentioned, but these are in, in rate version. So it's the per 50 minute rate of each one of these, but um, a, play, a player like Riley, and I don't think it's all that um, uh, maybe surprising for Leafs fans to hear is, is, uh, he, he definitely um, has, he, he can struggle defensively. Now he's had some good seasons here and there, um, but it, it, overall he generally, he, he has been, I would say more valuable uh, and, and he had a really, really good season two years ago as well. But um, where that he, he is adding a lot of offense, but um, also his value defensively, he's just give, he's making it uh, one way to think about it is it's, it's, it, he, he makes it a little harder on the goalie for Toronto or whatever team uh, a player like this would be on. It's a, it's a unique defenseman. There's lots of different players. And I think it gives a take, which sometimes it's hard to see for, especially for defense, because in my, in my opinion, the best defense is when you're not noticing it. That's when nothing's going on. That's yeah. when you feel like the best defense is happening. You're, you're holding on to the puck and that sort. So it's a unique, it's a unique way to analyze players. Then, you guys have another matter which you hinted at before, which is your goals above replacement model, your wins above replacement. So here again, we're going to stick with Jared Spurgeon. If you can see his wins above replacement, like bars, what I'm going to call it for now, well, what do you conclude from this number where it says he has 2.5 wins above replacement? Yeah, so especially it's also important, I think, to, to, um, to consider how players relate to their position uh, because it's, it's more – when you kind of are evaluating teams or you're trying to add, to add, add players or, or evaluate how good a player has, you kind of want to think about, and this gets, leads me into what this model is, is, is kind of who would we potentially replace that player with? That's the whole idea of this specific model. So war or wins above replacement is, is a really, um, it's been around for a long, long time in baseball. Uh, originally, the framework was developed by um, Bill James. I think it was kind of theorized back in the 80s. Uh, and it's, it's had some form or another, I think, for well, you know, close to 20 years. Um, it's pretty now like one of the very, very accepted in baseball and it's kind of used quite often. But in this case, what it's showing with the, what the model itself is, is it's trying to evaluate and, and add a, um, a, a single number that, that comprises or, or covers every aspect that we can measure with, with data and the, st and the things we have available. Um, it, it assigns a single number to every component and then sums that to a value of how valuable uh, is that player um, how much value did that player add to their team um, relative to the league and to their position and to the rest of um, to a lot of other things that go in the model. And so in this one, Spurgeon at 2.5 war, especially for a defenseman is a really high end. Um, it's a really, really good year. I, we had him, I think in our top five for the Norris, it was one of the best defensive or uh, defenseman seasons in uh, the, in the 1920 season. Um, just a little bit more, I'll kind of go through what is, what's showing here. Cause it, it can be kind of uh, daunting for some people to kind of pop here and then be like, I have no idea what I'm looking at. And as a reminder, um, we do have a, if you go up into the more, there's a references and a glossary section that do provide a lot of value for people who want to understand more. So references will have our write-ups on how these models work. And you, if you really want to dig into the weeds, that's where you would potentially, you know, you could go and then the references kind of cover the names and the columns and what you're looking at. But here we have, it's EVO, EVD. Um, those are even strength offense and defense. So we're just, it's the evaluation of how that 
player performed at the even strength states, which are three, you know, 3v3, 3 44, and 5v5. Um, and then <clears throat> PPO is power play offense. Uh, SHD is shorthanded defense. And then we have take and draw, which is the value that they add um, in penalties. So how, you know, do they, if you think about um, taking, uh, taking value or taking penalties value would be someone who doesn't take a lot of penalties. They're preventing their, they're, they're allowing their teams to, to not have to play shorthanded as much. Um, same thing with drawing. So some players have a skill at being able to draw penalties. So if you're able to give your team more power play time, that's definitely something that would be valuable. And so then those are the kind of the components that make up uh, war. And so that number on 2.5 is actually then a win. It's a conversion from the GAR metric, which is goals above replacement. Uh, just like in baseball, baseball evaluates all on runs. So, you know, how many runs did a player potentially add from a value standpoint? We use goals because that's the um, ultimately the, the objective of the game. That's the same kind of, it's a really frame uh, basis for a lot of this evaluation is we want to get it into one number that's relative to the league and we can look at what the scoring um, environment is like and, and, and evaluate kind of that way. Uh, and then the win, wins or, and then war and spar are, um, or are as far as uh, standing points above replacement. So these are um, in values of wins would be just a general win. Um, it's a little bit hard to maybe interpret right away, which is why we then added standing points above replacement, which is just a conversion that tries to put that value in um, how many points or standing points did this player uh, add to their team within a given year. So in this, in this year, um, our model would say that Spurgeon had provided five standing points to his team above what a replacement player would be able to provide, which is exceptional. It, it, the Spartan, I, I don't have it offhand, but um, I think some of the highest, uh, and I, I probably should go look at this if I wanted to get it right, but you could just go and ser search the highest um, numbers. Yeah, I was going to just say that's that's essentially the kind of a long overview of what this table is showing. And yeah, so if you if you look at um, if you just kind of sort by um, spar, yeah, so uh, eight point five, and you'll notice that most of these are uh, are forwards, except for we have Ellis, Yossi, and then McAvoy and Slavin. But pretty soon we start to see that Spurgeon is in you know top twenty, top thirty players of the nineteen twenty season. And so um, obviously th this is that's kind of where it tops out. I, there have been some very uh yeah so he's i think he was yeah finished top 30 um and we have you know so so among defensemen he was there were only a few you know maybe six or seven defensemen above him in terms of who had a better year in that year but spar generally tops out around like 10 would be very very good um we don't really see that very often there are some years like mcdavid in 16 17 or datsuk's um early you know 2007 2008 08 09 those seasons but um yeah that's kind of a, a broad but long overview of what this is showing what's kind of available here i think uh, just to clarify some people might be confused what would be the difference between someone taking a look at the even strength defense here with war and what's it called and the expected goals against and porcy against for rapham what would be the key differences between the two yeah so i'm glad i'm actually really glad that you asked that because it is something that some people um they are kind of comparable because the the war model uh, and and is is based it's based around and uses um, the same kind of framework that Rapham framework or RAPM framework um, as the as the basis. It's kind of, it gets kind of tricky to describe uh, clearly where I, I don't get into too much jargon basically. But um, ultimately, each one of the, these models, each one of the components here, it is it, its own model. So we have a separate model for each one of the components that evaluates. Um, given and we, and we use box score stats or what we call box score stats, but um, because it's it's kind of complicated, but we end up actually for each of them for EV offense and defense, we use actually what's called relative to teammate stats um, at the single season level, which is very similar to um, the Rappo model, except what relative to teammate is is a uh, more of like a, a a simpler version that. Um, is uh, it's it's you can work with a little bit more because you're not actually it's not really it's not it's not actually a model it's a calculation that then is a little bit more um, easy to be applied to single seasons and so the back end of each of these components is really relative to teammate and then a bunch of other box score stats so anything that you we would have available that would be either a for um, an offensive or defensive evaluation tool at a box score level um, or it's really play by play derived <coughs> uh, excuse me uh metrics and so um that's kind of what goes in there uh the evd and so like i think maybe you, you alluded to but some people have, will notice too that the evd model here 
generally is pretty close. We're in line with what that wrap them chart looks like. And we use XGA. So it's expected goals against there. That's all that it is. We don't include um, goals against or, or uh, shot, shot attempts against. So it's all XGA. So the, the XGA bar on that wrap them chart should be or is very similar to this EBD number, but it's this is not an Z score. So it can be maybe hard to compare, but you'll see the good players here will also show up good on the wrap and chart because they're basically, it's the same idea there. All right, the last time I'm gonna ask you, I'm actually gonna go back to wrap and quickly since this is something which like, it's been debated a lot. I'm gonna bring up Shea Theodore's wrap and chart and it'll sort of hopefully touch into, if my computer doesn't let me down, if we, Hopefully it'll touch into the idea of expected goals too, if you want to talk about that. There has been lots of, there's been discussions about Shea Theodore and his, as you can see, his like 3Z, he's above a 3Z yeah. score for expected goals for, and people have talked about how, like looked into the fact that Vegas, the Golden Knights actually are scoring less when he's on the ice, despite his really, really high expected goals for per 60. And what's your take on the whole entire situation about, Shea Theodore, the Golden Knights, and his chance generation in general, and and is there is there a possibility that the chances that he's generating are like high volume but not as high quality per se? Yes, that's actually a really good question because I think that this is something that some people miss is how um, there are differences in these metrics and and how we use them to evaluate players. This is a great example of a player who um, would be considered kind of more of like the classic analytics darling darling uh but maybe doesn't have the results especially offensively there there, there are players that pop up every so often the one i always think about is sean bergenheim who it hasn't been a league for several years now but um he he was kind of this player especially early on in the mid 2010 so like sometime 2014 2015 when when the idea of Corsi and shot attempts evaluation these things um and then expected goals got introduced they really started to show some players who had really high XG um, values, but they didn't have the goals to back it up. And it's a, it's a really important point because it's, you might think that because the name expected goals, like eventually say in this discrepancy where you have XG and goals for, you would think maybe this would indicate that Theodore is, is in the future going to have a big spike in his goals for, which isn't actually the case because there are um, other things working here that we can't capture really in the data. And so what this is showing is that, Theodore, he, he does, first of all, his, his Corsi numbers here, shot attempt numbers here are also really, really good. And so what that is generally means is that it's, he's helping his team produce opportunities. Um, and so it's, but the thing that with defensemen especially is it can be very hard for a defenseman to influence whether or not a goal is scored. Forwards have a lot more, um, a lot more ability to control whether or not a shot they have um, or they make or their teammates make. Uh, will become a goal because they're closer to the net. Generally, they, as we get closer to the net, our uh, the probability that a shot will become a goal goes up. That's what we see with XG. And so what you're seeing here really is that Shader Theodore is produces um, above the uh, defenseman league average by far like a ton of XG and, 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 and shot attempts, which means that when he is on the ice, his team has uh, is getting really a lot is getting a lot of shots, really quality chances. Um, a lot of the shots that he is influencing and is a part of are, are um, converting are they're they're uh, at a much higher level of quality than than another defenseman would be. But ultimately, what we know about hockey, obviously, is that goal scoring is pretty fluky and random a lot of the time especially for defensemen. Defensemen take a lot of point shots. Um, you know, th those are really low quality uh, or at least low probability shots that generally are more a lot of the time like, like they're trying to get maybe a, a rebound in front or deflection or a screen that kind of stuff but what we see over in aggregate is that those shots um, are generally not uh, they don't convert all the time so it, it could be about his play style it could also one of the things that is really important to note here as well is that we can't really um, we try we can a little bit uh, but it, it can be very difficult to, to to build into a model how that player is being utilized the um, specifically around like Maybe they're uh, um, like also and the other thing is their environment and, and how they're being deployed and, and their teammates and maybe chemistry. That, that stuff is we can't particularly um, or we can include, especially chemistry uh, and that kind of stuff and, and internally um, <clears throat> on the team. And so really what you have with with Theodore 
or is that he just has, he's been very, very good at, produce, at, at helping his team produce shots and produce very high quality shots, but they just haven't really gone in. Um, I think that this would be a great example of somebody who's gotten very unlucky, but to kind of circle back on my point about like Sean Borgenheim and these type of players is for whatever reason you do see, it's very rare, but you will see players who over long stretches of time, like we're talking over 3000, maybe 4,000 minutes, maybe their whole career, they just put up these kind of numbers. And then they, they, for whatever reason, the goals just don't ever come. And I think that also is something that is important to kind of look at is that from an evaluation standpoint of, of uh, for, for player um, analysis, it is important to understand how teams are evaluating these players and how um, maybe ultimately like Theodore hasn't, he's still above average. Like he's still a good defenseman here, even without the crazy XG um, numbers here. And, and he's, it's, it's kind of uh, rare to have a, like, like I guess said again, defensemen even who are above average, in offense and defense, because it's generally one or the other a lot of the time. Um, and so in this case, it's 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 hard to really say exactly why these differ. My, my guess is that it's a combination of luck, um, also probably a combination of maybe play style and, and maybe some um, more systems work or coaching that, that goes on with Vegas. I, I don't, I, I, to be honest, I haven't watched a lot of um, Vegas over like I, a little bit, but I, I, I can't say I've, I've seen a lot uh, of Vegas games enough to really kind of have a, a hunch about what's going on there. That's fair enough. I wanted to ask you about something because this has been like it's been a topic for a debate. And Jay Fresh wrote an article about like he would dug deep into like Shay Theodore. Why isn't why aren't they just matching their expected goals since they are a team that by your model and most models they generate a lot of expected goals, but it really ends up as goals for so it's just something to it's something to be to look into and I guess especially when there's more and more unique players coming up in the NHL. Yeah, I mean, just also the other thing I maybe I didn't I think I mentioned earlier, but it's also um, that shooting talent is is definitely a thing, especially among forwards um, and defensemen. There are some defensemen, like I said, Matt Matt Dumba. It's been a little bit. It's been a season or two, but also like Ryan Ellis is another player um, on, on defense, and, and and players have the ability to with just their shot and their skill at their shot to score goals above what other players do. And so in certain cases, you and we've seen this a lot. Just as a wild fan. In the, the Wild have had great um, numbers a lot of the time from their team level, especially XG, but a lot of that gets driven by their defense because they're so good at preventing uh, chances. But um, <clears throat> they also have a trouble scoring goals, and that's really because they don't really have a lot of players um, who have a good, who really have a high, uh, you know, have high, have a, a really good shot. Or, or like somebody like Patrick Liney is a great example of a player, and it's kind of that's maybe a little bit overdone there in terms of me saying like, oh, you can just go out and get someone like Liney because he, he's very rare. But in general, you will see players who pop above the rest in terms of their ability to shoot. And so certain teams might have a really good system that leads to these kind of chances. But if they also don't maybe have a player or two who can kind of score when they have them or have more of a of uh, the ability to direct their shot in a, in a really skillful way, that also is something that that can can lead to results that might look like this too. I think we've talked a lot about chances. So the last thing I want to talk about is goalies. So your guys is, yeah. I'm going to open that up. It's been noted by almost everyone in the analytical community that goalies are very, very random. So how would you explain goalies from the perspective of analytics? Yeah, that's a really good thing to say up front. Um, goalies are, I always, you know, they, I don't know how old it is. I always like to just basically say that goalies are voodoo. Like it's, it's, I, and, and we kind of have, it's almost a meme at this point with Luke and I, but a lot, we do have goalie analysis and it, it, because I do think it's interesting, but it also is um, something that I don't focus on a lot because I think that goalies are very difficult to evaluate given the data we have right now. And even when we get more data and you keep it, we've been hearing for years about player tracking. Um, the thing with goalies is it just takes a long time for you to really know what you have and maybe by the point that you actually have gotten enough data to understand who that player is they've kind of are a different player now um i think one of the you know there's only a few goalies who have been consistently good for the last five years or something which is very different than skaters right and and like lundquist is the one guy who's basically was good his whole career and kind of fell off as he got older which is to you know to be um understood and then you have players who bounce around like Carey price for two years was the best goal in the league and he's been very mediocre for years and you know with skaters though you have a much more consistent trend a lot of the time in terms of aging in terms of development and or not development but in terms of just play um and so what you see is that it sometimes takes you know like 
hundreds of games before you kind of understand how good of, and a lot of times it's mostly in, in retrospect is like, then we look back and see like, Oh man, this goalie actually ended up being really good. Um, I think this table is just kind of shows general defensive um, numbers that are about, and you can see save percentage F save percentage and XF uh, save percentage or just Fenwick save percentage. So it's their, um, their uh, uh, save percentage, but on, um, uh, all unblocked shots and then expected Fenwick save percentage involves XG and then um, Delta Fenwick save is the difference between the two. And then um, goal save goal average is that's, I think on hockey reference. So that's kind of a standard, just how much, how many goals do they save uh, compared to the average goalie in the league? And then goal save above expected is just a comparison um, between the number of shots they face and their XG. I think I'm getting this right. To be honest, I haven't uh, worked with a lot of goalie stuff in a while. So I sometimes have to go actually read our own glossary to remind myself what every one of these is. But um, it not to say that I don't understand it because we've made them all. It's just that I don't work with goalie data um, a ton. And I also try to avoid it. We don't have contract projection for goalies, even though we probably should. But I, I just think in general, it's it's from a, and I'm kind of going off, off uh, topic here, but I think from an, now as a standpoint goalies are very very important to a team but they're also it could be kind of like throwing darts if you get a good goalie and a lot of time it's more just luck it could be circumstance it could be your coaching could be what's going on behind the scenes a lot of that stuff just is really impactful that we can't really know and so you'll have a player like you know like the like you see Bobrovsky got the huge contract or Carey Price got a huge contract or you know Vasilevsky got a huge contract and I, I think a lot of the time it's it's very it can be very scary for a team to hand out big contracts like that because you'll see like what happened with Kerry Price is he just hasn't added nearly the value that they were kind of expecting um, and so that that's kind of my general philosophy and overview but at the same time it especially in the playoffs goalies are really really important and a lot of the time you almost feel like just hoping that you got lucky and you rolled a you know you rolled the right dice for you got you know. It, it just we flip the coin right like that's how goalies especially in the playoffs come off but they are impactful so we it's important to understand to understand that we should be looking at them but how much we can actually pull out of some of the data i think could be pretty tricky i'm a Canucks fan and then so i like to reference the fact for goalies being voodoo like you said if you like in the set round against Vegas, so everyone's talking about marston went down there's lots of concern amongst like, you know the fans that like this, the series was over and marston isn't in role they're going to be screwed and then Damco came in and just played sensational for the remaining games of the series. So I think that uh, proves the point, exactly, the idea yeah. of the voodoo goalies and the whole entire nature. Then I just want to ask you something. There's been concerns, like not concerns, but people have brought up biases for like rink bias in terms of like in the Madison Star Garden where the shots are recorded too closely to the net uh, or yeah. like Tampa being too far. Do you guys have any plan to like work that into your goalie models at all, or is that something that you're not too concerned with right now? Yeah, so it is. It is something that um that we've we've and we've actually um talked about doing it for years. I mean, we've been we've been talk, uh we've worked and looked into it a little bit here and there. Um, I think the thing that's important to remember about the rank bias is that it's it doesn't um it's especially at so if we're talking about about skaters you really don't see a lot of rink bias impacting our evaluation tools like our, and especially on our website, our models um, that much. It's going to change a little bit, but you mentioned with goalies, goalies are very impactful. And one of the things I think that I can admit freely, because we, you know, this is a, a pro, I guess a, a quote unquote bias or problem that we have with the data is that Lundquist in terms of our goalie war and some of the other goalie metrics looks like insane, especially in the early years. Um, and that's because we don't have a uh, adjustment for that. Um, we haven't changed it, but the thing with that is, um, you kind of go down a rabbit hole and uh, in terms of figuring out how to adjust rank bias. And it also, I, I will be also upfront. It, it's, it gets into math that I don't particularly feel that confident in. Um, and so one of the worries would be in, in adjusting for that rank bias <clears throat> is that you, um, that you would be adjusting shots that you shouldn't and that you should be, you would be making maybe more subjective decisions about shot locations than you would ultimately like. And so it, it is really tricky because when you start to adjust all shots at a rink or for a team, you need to do it at the league level. So you can't just say, oh, we're going to adjust, um, you know, it needs to be every league and, and every rink needs to be taken into account and so you can get into tricky situations where you could potentially be over adjusting in the wrong way or you could be um you know you could be penalizing players uh because you messed something up or something you didn't know because there's millions and millions of shots and it, it can be very difficult so but the one thing is that it, it's i would say 
the rink bias also is very impactful on the numbers for goalies because goalies just play um, a ton of time on ice. You know, like when you look at Hellebuck, like he's got 3,300 minutes there, which is just like career. That's like career numbers for some players, uh, skaters, right? So they just are on the ice all the time. Obviously, I'm, I'm not really saying anything, you know, groundbreaking there. But because of that, they face all the shots. Anything that's off from the recording and the data is going to be going to show up a lot more for goalies than it will for skaters. So it's definitely something that we plan to look into in the future. Um, I would think when we uh, potentially redo, redo our XG model um, at some point in the next year, uh, that will definitely be something that we'll be trying trying to account for. I think that there are a couple teams like the Rangers, like you mentioned that and Tampa and then Minnesota is another one that looks a little weird, although I think it's maybe it's really the Rangers. And I think the Islanders a couple of years um, who are, have some definite issues with the, and it's specifically, it is important to understand. It's really like the first three seasons of data that we have, which is the 2007 to 2009 season. Th those seasons are, uh, are pretty, can be pretty bad for a couple teams. So it's something to keep in mind. We probably, we should, should make a note on the site that just maybe explains that a little bit, maybe throw it in the glossary, I think would be pretty good. But yeah, that's, that's kind of the general ideas behind rank bias and especially with goalies. All right. I do think we've covered almost the whole entire website and I'd like to thank you so much for your time. I think there seems to often be a divide between what people from who are really like they've bought into the analytics a lot and people who haven't. So I think getting having a platform for people to understand what's what's going on behind the work and what what these numbers are saying and just how much it matches their initial beliefs about hockey is something that'll help a lot. So thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. It's uh, been my pleasure.